standing up, this is going to be a long day. Uh, this is not a short presentation. There's some seats down here in the front. There's only a couple over there. Um, I have to say this. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Matt Kambick, and I'm the president of our corporation. And I'd like to say welcome to all of you. Clearly, what we're here to discuss today is the most important thing that's gone on in this theater since I was here Saturday night for the Eagles tribute. <laughs> but seriously, the last time I saw the theater filled like this was in 2016 when we, we were voting on buying the golf courses. So I know this is a very important discussion topic for you all today, and I want to welcome you. I'm going to do something a little bit different. And I hope you'll give me a little space here. Y'all don't know us. And I know that by the emails I received some, from some of the folks in this community. So I want to take a minute, and I want to make sure you know who I am. And I want to make sure you know who each of the people are that are sitting on your board. My name's Matt. My wife back in the back row is Patty. So if you're in the back row, don't say anything bad about me. She's taking notes. But we've been here 10 years. We closed on our home in 2014, January 2014. We were excited to move here from Ohio. And uh, we love the blue skies. We love the mountains. We love this community. And uh, so I want to introduce my vice president, our vice president, Dan Linegar, and he's going to tell you a little about himself. Good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> So far, so okay, good. okay, board <laughs> meeting started at 10 in the morning. I'm sorry. Good afternoon. Glad that you all are here. Uh, my name is Dan Lindiger. I'm vice president um, of the board this year. I really welcome everyone here. It's a, like Matt said, it's an important topic. My wife and I have been here since 2006. So we've been homeowners in Saddlebrook for quite a long time. Uh, loved every minute of it and uh, will enjoy it going forward as well. So I think that's enough for me. Thank you, Dan. Our treasurer is Mark Eckert. Yes, Mark Eckert, uh, treasurer this year, year. I drew the short straw. So, uh, But uh, I, my wife Pam and I have been here since 2017, moved well from the Bay Area, but originally from Chicago and then most of the time in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So a Midwestern person. And uh, again, uh, really love living here also. So uh, really thank everybody for coming. This is really great. I don't know that we've ever had a sold out uh, stage like this. So this is great. They're not supposed to be standing up along this. Thanks, Mark. Next, I'd like to introduce you to our secretary, Sean Kreiderman. Thanks, Matt. Sean Kreiderman uh, moved into uh, Unit 49, the best unit in Saddlebrook, in 2009. And I'm not here. I'm in rehearsal for the House of Agatha Mystery, and I'm Agatha. <laughs> I'm, or I'm at the swimming pool, or I'm playing pickleball. I have been asked many, many times, well, how do you like being on the board? I love it. I'm happy to be your representative. Thank you, Sean. Next up, I'll introduce you to the newest member of our team, our assistant treasurer, Larry Santora. I guess that's me. Um, we've been here since 2010 from Tucson. Well, we got to Tucson in early 72 after the stint in Vietnam, originally from Seattle. I uh, am a retired CPA that had a public practice and uh, sat on a another set of boards for over 26 years with a lot of the same kinds of problems that we're having here. I hope I can bring a little insight to what's going on. Sitting next to Larry is one of our directors, Chuck Kill. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chuck Kill. I am uh, my third year on the board. I originally uh, grew up in Chicago, lived in eight states before moving to Oro Valley in 2003. Have been in resident of Saddlebrook since 2019. Like uh, Larry, my background is a CPA and uh, many years as a CFO and a CEO for several retail companies, most recently here in Arizona. Thank you. 
And the one member of our team that is not with us today is Denise Lexell. Her and Lee are in Florida. Their third granddaughter was born a week ago. They're down hugging grandbabies. Walter Yazi is our general manager. I'd like to introduce him on the far end. Good afternoon. I'm Walter Yazi. I'm your general manager. I've been here at Saddlebrook for about nine years, but I've been the general manager just over one year. And the reason I'm here is because I believe in your community. I enjoy coming and seeing you use your facilities and appreciate you using them and participating in everything that we try to put on. And just a quick note here, we are definitely above the fire code. So everybody that is up against the wall, um, just know that we are beyond the fire code to have you in here. So be aware of that. Don't let, I would prefer no more people come into the theater because we are already over packed. Thank you. Thanks, Walter. <laughs> and the last person sitting on the stage is no stranger to you. He served as our treasurer last year. He is now the chairman of our finance committee. And along with me, he's going to be responsible for sharing the information we have with you today. So Campbell, please introduce yourself. Thanks, Matt. Is this on? Can you hear me? Thanks, Matt. Um, I moved to Saddlebrook in May of 2021, a little less than three years ago. Spent 35 years in the San Francisco Bay Area. I moved here for the mountain views, the short walk to the community pool from my house, and the pleasant appeal of the community. Um, I don't play golf, not really. Don't play tennis, don't play pickleball. Um, Shame. I had a 30 year career in finance, mostly investment banking, hedge fund, and private equity investing. Um, kind of way I, I got here to this table is I joined, after coming here, acclimating to Arizona, being the finance guy that I am, I started digging into the financials and quickly noticed the big subsidy and losses in golf and food and beverage. So I decided to join the golf committee or try and join the golf committee to see if I could help out with some of the numbers. Shortly after that, I was recruited to join the finance committee to help with the investments. Um, that led, short months later, this is in early 22. A few months after that, there was a board position that opened up. I was asked to run for the board in summer of 22 for an 18 month tenure ending in end of 23. I won that election, runoff election. Thank you very much for that. Um, they made me treasurer in 23. I um, tried to get reelected at the end of 23 and was not reelected, so I was off the board. Then I was asked to join the finance committee as its chairman since this chairman had just retired. So here I am, back in it, thick and thin. Thank you for that. I got to do a little housekeeping. I would like to ask you to silence your phones. I want you to know that this session is being videotaped and the briefing slides will be posted online. Okay, I have a couple of opening thoughts and we'll get after it. We have a community challenge, that's why you're here. The challenge is related to our reserve fund and the requirements we face as a community in meeting our obligations over the next 10 years. We have arrived at a point in our history where the realities of transition from the de developer to self-government are smacking us in the face. This is a common occurrence in the life cycle of communities such as ours. It is an uncomfortable reality. We all have different reactions to the prospect that things are changing. Some common themes are costs are out of control, the board spends money foolishly, we never get to vote on what the board is doing, and there are many others. Some things have become apparent to me over the last couple of months. We as a community do not possess a collective understanding about what a common interest community is. We do not fully understand the role and responsibilities of the board. And we as a community are frustrated at the situation 
we find ourselves in. And I was being generous because the people that get red-faced in my face are angry. If it were in my power to the ignore the predicament we're in, I would do it. That wouldn't be fair to you. It wouldn't address the problem that is in front of us. And it would be irresponsible of your board. So today, we're going to accomplish three things if we don't accomplish anything else. I will present a brief discussion on the road to our formation and how we've arrived here in 2024. Campbell is going to present to you the Replacement Reserve Analysis Group information that is the foundation for today's discussion. And I'll conclude with some information about our focus groups. We conducted six of them. 58 of our residents participated. From these 58 residents came a great deal of feedback and more than 200 questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we will see our way through this challenge. We need to be collectively thoughtful, deliberate, and we need to be steady. But most importantly, we need to pull together as a community to chart the course of our future. As most of you know, the board has recently presented its strategic plan to the community and the staff. We have a mission statement and a vision statement. And these documents serve as our guidepost in decision making. Next slide, Rick. Rick, can the slides be up there? Thank you. Take care, Kim. He got the hard job. All right, our mission statement's up there. You can read it. This is why we exist. And I want to emphasize the reason why your corporation exists is to provide a broad variety of amenities and activities. That's what was here when you got here. We have to maintain our facilities and we have to deliver quality services to our members. You all. Next slide, Rick. This is the vision statement we carved out. Are we okay? All right. We carved out this vision statement to be the premier active adult community of choice in Southern Arizona. What does that mean? 5,500 different answers to that question. But that's what we said we were going to hold ourselves up to, is that we were going to create the kind of community that people like you and I will continue to want to come to. That's what our journey is all about. Next slide. So I'll give you a little background. We go through training with our lawyer. He sits us down every year. And he tells us that our purpose in life is to enforce our use restrictions. You could read that as rules. And to maintain the common areas. Now that's not the common area where we're doing maintenance today. Our common areas are the $28 million worth of assets to show up on the balance sheet. That's everything that we have here. That's three clubhouses, that's tennis courts, golf courses, swimming pools that are heated, and all the rest of this stuff that we all enjoy. And the interesting thing that I found out by doing a survey with you, there's no universal thing you love outside of this theater. This is the one amenity 
that everybody in the community, okay, almost everybody in the community, thinks is valuable to the community. You got the golf mafia, the tennis mafia, the pickleball mafia, the swimming pool mafia, the table tennis mafia. We got a lot of different disparate interests and groups. And that's what makes up our community. And that's why we're a common interest community. Next slide. So, when I got elected to this board, and I try to remember the reasons why I ran for the board, <laughs> but one of you all left me a gift. This gift was left at the Mountain View Golf Shop with a note that says, I wish you the very best, lead well for our community. This is a book about HOAs that was written by John Corona, who happens to be the president and CEO of Associa, the largest management company of HOAs in the world. So I think John knows a thing or two about advising an ignorant, if you're a former soldier, I'm a dat. For those of you that aren't soldiers, that's a dumbass tanker. And so I spent 36 years in the military. And what I learned in all that is if you don't know what you're doing, go find somebody smarter than you that can help you. And so besides John's book and all the stuff that we read in statues and our CCRs, our Articles of Incorporation, Rules and Regulations, you find out it could synthesize something, something like this. Our responsibilities are to protect your assets. We have fiduciary obligations. We actually have to be honest. We have to, be, we have to have integrity. We have to be loyal to you and to our community. And we have to have the duty of full disclosure. Now some of y'all write an email to me don't understand that we understand what our job is. And you think we don't do those things. And it saddens me. We have a delegation of authority. We delegate that authority to Walter Yazzie over there and his wonderful staff that delivers every service that we enjoy in this community. We can never delegate our responsibility to you. Next slide. And I want to stomp the floor because this is the biggest responsibility we have to you to maintain, protect, and enhance the value of your assets. Next slide. So we have a challenge. I'll be the first of two to hold this up for you. This is our 2022 reserve study. Campbell weighed his, it was only four pounds. In here is 30 years of requirements. We're here today talking about the next 10. And what those requirements add up to is 45 to $50 million of responsibility to maintain your assets. We have a problem. We don't have enough money programmed with your current dues to get us through that next decade. And so you're gonna find out a lot of things today. You're gonna to find out what your dues pay for. You're gonna find out the difference between operations and the reserves. Campbell's gonna make you really smart about all of that. What I wanted to do was set the stage and tell you what the problem is. So let me give you a little bit of history. Next slide, Rick. Our first house was built in 1995 in Unit 15. Robeson subsidized the operations of our community all the way through 2001. From the year 2002 forward to transition, we had enough residents, we had enough homes built, we had enough dues that we were paying for the operations of this community ourselves. It's been a long time since I had to talk to a crowd this big. 
Our first reserve study was completed in 2008. From 2009 to 2017, the reserve fund grew to $5,855,438. Bill Onecker didn't give me any sense, so I didn't think there was any sense. When we went to transition in 2018, the reserve study that board had available to it was completed in 2016. January 1st, 2018, we transitioned. Let me give you some numbers. In 2001, we had 1,253 homes that were closed here. A year later, we had 1,488 homes. When we transitioned on January 1st, we had 2,912 homes. And today, we have 3,182 homes. Next slide. The first reserve study completed after transition was done in 2019. The board, at that time, recognized things were changing on them very rapidly. They, they planned to rebuild the irrigation system in Mountain View by borrowing money because there was no way to rebuild it any other strategy except coming to you for money. And so that was the plan that they put in place. They also put in a plan to increase our dues 15%, 10%, and 5%, which they did over the succeeding three years. But everything around here gets a vote. Roads get a vote. Air conditioner units get a vote. Pump stations get a vote. In 2019, the first of two of our pump stations at Mountain View quit. The money to replace it wasn't programmed. The pump station was in its 23rd year of use. Its life expectancy was 20 years. In 2020, the second pump station got replaced and in 2021, the board approved the Mountain View Golf Course Renovation Plan. Next slide. The renovation was completed. Last piece of grass was laid on December 2nd, but it was completed in our 27th year of operation. The board borrowed $6 million. The project scope included a new irrigation system, drainage upgrades, new T decks, bunker rebuild, turf reduction, and a cart path. I can point out to you at the note at the bottom, all of that was out of the reserves. Next slide. What I want to do here is give some credit to the board at that time in 2021 when they devised the strategy because they managed to accomplish some cost savings for us as a community. They chose to reduce the bunker size from 70,000 square feet to 50,000. The bunkers are much shallower today than they were before the re renovation. This reduces the cost to our association of replacing sand in the future years by 20,000 square feet of sand in the life cycle of that sand is seven years. The turf reduction was done to take about 10% of the ground we were watering out that did not impact play. We live in Arizona. The use of water has serious considerations in our state. And there are controls coming our way. The board had the foresight at that time to make the decision to execute this as part of the renovation. This is gonna save seven and a half acres of watering on an annual basis in perpetuity. I wanted to see if I could say that word for you. Maintenance efficiencies that were gained. Bunker maintenance. They can now get into every bunker 
and they can do it with a little tractor, and it takes less man hours, less manpower. Mowing efficiencies. Some folks want to know why bunkers were moved. Bunkers were moved a little bit away from the greens so we could get our mechanical equipment between the greens and the bunkers to facilitate maintenance, mowing, and uh, chemical application processes. And the irrigation system itself that was put into the ground, we used HDPE for the irrigation system instead of PVC. The reason for that is PVC has a life expectancy of 20 or 25 years. HDPE is 50 years or longer. All of these, all of this went into the thought process in renovating the Mountain View Golf Course, and I'm sure most of you are probably hearing that for the first time. Next slide. So another thing that people talk about, I've only been accused, uh, if you don't know, I'm called Mr. Golf. Uh, I was the chairman of the golf committee for a couple of years. And Mike Gogol came to us in 2021, and we developed the Mountain View uh, Master Plan. And what this chart shows you is all the ideas that came out of that master plan. Well, we knew full well we couldn't get everything done. So we said, what do we have to do? All the things that had passed their life cycle expectation had to be dealt with. All the aspirational projects got pushed to the right. You'll notice in the middle that back in 2021, the debate on the should do's was long and at times contentious well into 2022. But we ended up with the turf reduction initiative. We ended up putting the car path from nine to 10 in. We did that with GIF dollars. And we built the 15th green complex. And only the people who would appreciate that are the golfers that get to enjoy playing on that. That was also paid through GIF dollars. Next slide. So let me continue with our history. The next reserve study was produced in 2022. What happened between 2019 and 2022? COVID, supply chain disruption. Anybody remember the largest inflation year in 40 years? The perfect storm has fallen on our heads. The 2022 reserve study was the most comprehensive evaluation of the golf components on our courses. In September of 2022, Joyce Howard was our treasurer, and she presented a report on the 2022 reserve study. And she showed us clearly the difference in costs going forward were going to be much greater than those that came out of the 2019 reserve study. In 2023, Campbell Cheney raised the alarm with the board. He was insistent. He was aggressive about it. He was determined that we were going to address this problem. In May, he established the Re uh, Replacement Reserve Analysis Group, and they did their work through the rest of the year, which culminated in the report to the board and the community at the 13 December board working meeting. Next slide. So here's a nice summary chart for all that stuff I just told you. In 2016, the reserve study said, we got a $56 million requirement over the next 30 years. That's what our 2018 board inherited. One short year later, uh, Golf got added, costs went up, and we had a $100 million plan for the next 30 years. And when we got the 2022 plan, the number had grown to $136 million. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why we're here today. Nobody did anything wrong. The truth changed every three years. Next slide. So, every day when I wake up and I remind myself what I'm doing on your behalf, I have to remember this. 
I took the average, this is my chart, I made it. So if you're mad about it, it's on me. But I got the total sales for each, each year. And the average sale and the number of homes, and that's how those numbers get developed. So as we grew more homes, obviously we got more homes, but we lived through this incredibly solid period of time of low interest rates until 2023. In 2023, we had the smallest number of resales since transition. We only had 158. We average on an annual basis 197. Interest rates matter. Oh, by the way, that's $1.8 billion worth of home values we're sitting on in our community. Next slide. So here it is again. I'm going to say it one more time. We got a problem. We got to catch up. Campbell's going to give you our best thinking about ways forward to do that. Next slide. I wish you could have been in the rooms with us when Campbell was describing the asteroid that was going to crash on the board in 2026. I was doing the arithmetic to see if I was still going to be on the board. <laughs> in partnership with the Finance Committee Chair, a fine gentleman by the name of Dale Lehman, they put together the best brains we had from a finance perspective to study this problem. They went to work in May. Next slide. So here we are, we're at an inflection point in the history of our community. We're in our seventh year of actually owning this place, and now we're being faced with some tough decisions. As Dan likes to say, we've arrived at the fork in the road. Campbell's gonna talk to you about the options, I won't belabor them. But here's what you need to know. We're giving you our best thinking and there are a multitude of ways of going after this problem set that we're faced with. But I want you to know that this RRA group did an extraordinary amount of work looking at all of those different options. And what you're left with here today is the best outcomes they could deliver. At the end, you're gonna to get to decide. Next slide. So I want to make this clear in my presentation. That green box over there is the 45 or $50 million of requirement in that reserve study. There's nothing in here that's a want. I need to make that clear. There's nothing in this book that is a want. It's based on the best information available in national databases to tell us how long an asset should last, when it needs to be replaced, so we can have confidence that it will continue to serve us in the same manner that we expect each and every day. All roads, I'm gonna say this one more time, all roads lead to the green bucket. We don't have a choice. How we get there is gonna be up to y'all. Next slide. So, based on all of the information, this is my notes from the focus groups, the analysis, the 200 plus questions, and we've got all the information that was submitted by you all, by our fellow residents, from the 13 December town hall. And I've got 668 pages of comments and suggestions from the reserve study. If you don't think we're paying attention to what you're saying, you would be mistaken. And so what I want you to know is that I know not everybody understands where their money's going. So I'm going to take a minute. This chart, I wish I had a laser and I don't. The left box over there, represents our operating fund. 
The right box is our reserve fund. The operating fund is the general day-to-day -day operations of our community. The reserve fund provides for replacement and major repair of existing HOA assets with the following characteristics. We own it. It has a limited useful life. It has a predictable remaining life. And each component in that document is valued at $5,000 or more. The box on top, the blue box, is your annual dues. Here in 2024, 70 cents out of every dollar went into the operating fund. 30 cents went into the reserve fund. On the right side over there is the community improvement fee. Anybody here buy your house from somebody that previously owned it? You paid this fee. This fee is one year of annual dues, and we collect that community improvement fee, and it goes into the capital improvement fund, at least as much as the board designates to go into the capital improvement fund. The capital improvement fund provides for new assets and amenities that would benefit our residents. Next slide. 598 components inside of that document. 202 belong to Mountain View, 61 to Desert View, 74 to the Preserve, 67 goes into a bucket we call property site, 161 are the golf courses, and 33 are 50 miles of roads. Next slide. Next slide. So we as a community have a challenge to face. We have arrived at the fork in the road. If we don't act, we'll keep moving along. You may not like where it takes us. If we act, we may be able to save you some money, and certainly the long-term prospects will be better than not acting. And what am I talking about? Your HOA dues. This year, our dues, our dues, I pay them too, are $700 more than HOA 1. Last year, they were 600 and some, 82, 620. And two years before, it was $1. Campbell's going to tell you why all that changed. But we have a dues problem. If you read Mona's information on the GIO Digest, you know that she put out a lot of information about other communities. Ours was at the top of the list. We know that. We understand that. And part of this discussion is how to change that over time. The question is, how are we going to work as a community to meet this challenge? Next slide. So I provided you some foundation. I'll let you know what our mission and vision is, what our purpose and responsibilities are. Told you what the community challenge is, a little bit about our history and how we got to 24, how we fund our association, and you understand the definition of the reserve fund. I'm now gonna hand this over to Campbell, and he's gonna take us through the really important information about the choices that we have before us. I just got to tell you, Campbell is one of the strongest supporters of our community that we have. And I'm so proud that he's, uh, it was a bitter pill that he swallowed in being voted off of this board. But he stepped up to be the chairman of our finance committee. And I cannot tell you the hours that have been put in by members of this board and Campbell and the members of his RRA group to get us to where we are today. We all owe him a debt of gratitude.
Thanks, Matt. Okay, Rick, next slide after that. No, don't groan. We have a nine-point pre nine presentation here. Don't groan because some of them are only one slide. So, the first part is our problem statement, which I'll get to. Then after that, I want to discuss how we got to where we are, then discuss why now, and then discuss where do our estimates come from. Matt described the reserve study and the 45 to $50 million coming from that. Then I want to talk about where will the reserve funds be spent, our assets, basically. And then talk a little bit, kind of a rehash of the December 13th meeting about the replacement reserve analysis group. I want to comment on some residents' thoughts that we got, some other remedies, and then which path to follow. Okay, Rick, next slide. Okay, problem statement. Next slide after that. Problem statement number one. A replacement reserve fund balance is behind by an estimated $4,600 per residence in meeting our near-term reserve expenditure projections to avoid several years of aggressive, anti-competitive future dues increases. The community will need to spend a projected $45 to $50 million over the next 10 years, or maybe more, if inflation hits harder than long-range planning. The expenditures are going to be lumpy, with the significant more resources needed in the front end in the next three to four years than in the back end which is a reason for an assessment and a vote from you all. Problem statement number two, our dues are not competitive with neighboring HOAs. As Metz just said, our 2024 dues are $700, 25% higher than our nearest and most alike HOA. And I say most alike because we have private roads, many of the other communities don't. We've got to pay for those as one example. This dues gap could widen if immediate and aggressive action is not taken, which could adversely affect home prices, important, and time on the market for home resales, also important. Okay, next slide. Okay, that was only one slide. Part two, how do we get here? You learned a little bit already about our transition. We transitioned with the first home being sold in 1995, and we transitioned to self-governance in 2018. What does self-governance mean? It means that residents are responsible on an equal basis, every home equal, to cover all costs in operating our amenities and maintaining our infrastructure assets and equipment. So, since in 2024, we're now into our seventh year after transition. And since transition, our HOA's compounded average annual dues increase, average dues increases per year is 8.5%, wildly higher than the 4.7% Ray for Phoenix. That's where a lot of the angst comes in. The easy to think that we have a lot of wasteful spending, a lot of just throw money at the problem, keep raising dues, those kinds of comments. But there's a reason for them being as high as they have been. The reserve fund needs have, it's because the reserve fund. The reserve fund needs accelerated and were higher than planned due to the unexpected high inflation and supply chain shortage in our post pandemic world. Reduce for operations, which is what we usually see to keep our amenities running, including the subsidies for golf, also called losses for golf, losses for food and beverage. The dues increases have only been 4.8%, pretty much in line with the, with the Phoenix inflation rate. Okay, next slide. So, all that gobbledygook I just told you, here it is in, in one simple slide, one slide. If you go back to 2018, the overall dues were $2,040. 1,800 and so were for operating, and 224 was for the reserve. That was only 11% allocation to the reserve from overall dues. Fast forward to 2024, we're now at $3,500 for our annual dues, and the allocation was $1,060, that's 30%. So we've gone from 11% to 30%. That is sucking up all the dues increases, because if you look at the middle column here where it says operating, it's gone from $1,800 and so dollars to $2,440, or basically in line with inflation. So the big, I said, the wild dues increases is because of our underfunded and being behind in our reserve spending, which is why we're here today. We need to catch that up. And also, one thing to keep in mind is from 23 to 24, 
we only increased our operating allocation by 1.7%. Inflation is running at 3%. So we're running this place pretty efficiently, in my opinion. What's, it, what's out of sync here is the reserve fund. All right. So why now? Part three. As I said, our dues are not competitive with nearby HOAs, which may impact both home values and time on the market for resale. Our dues gap to HOA 1 for this year is $700, up from 620 in 23, and only $1 four years ago. And that's going to be increasing unless something's done. To do nothing and only use dues increases, which we've done up until now, to meet our reserve fund needs would only likely keep us at a competitive disadvantage and also likely widen this already large gap. Next slide. So why now number two? Financial decisions need to be made now in order to best provide the needed resources to keep our community well maintained, important, while bringing us more in line with other HOAs on dues over time. And I'll repeat that. This is going to take a while. We need to act now so we can bring our dues more in line with others as they catch up to us over time. Also, some major assets and facilities are aging. We have a 25 to very old community. Things are getting, things are failing faster than we had otherwise anticipated. Examples, Matt said, the Mountain View Golf Course Pump Station failed in 2019. Unexpected. Paragon Drive, those who live in the preserve, currently failing. Anybody who drives that road tells me it's very scary. Clubhouse Drive, which I drive on, is currently failing. It's getting worse by the month. The preserved clubhouse roof replacement, also out of sync. It started leaking in 2021 and had to be replaced. And the Mountain View tennis courts, three of them are unstable. They're still being used, but they're, they're unstable, unusable because of poor construction design. They're not post-tension. Next slide. So, why now number three? The cost of replacing, remodeling, and renovating has been getting more expensive each year due to building cost inflation and supply shortages. Examples, in 2022, we replaced two of those Mountain View courts. They were redone with post-tension. The original bid was $160,000. The final cost was $310,000, double. The, Mountain, the 2023 Mountain View golf course renovation we had original bids were about 3.7 million. It's coming in two million dollars higher than that. And just last year, the Mountain View Boulevard repave, we had 680 thousand dollars. They were told in the road studies in 2021. The actual price was 938 thousand dollars. So you kind of get the idea that the costs are coming up because our aging community is aging, and things need to be replaced. So we're not alone. The road ahead is not unique. HOA 1 posted nine years of annual assessments in addition to large dues increases beginning in 2005, six years after transition, about where we are. And that totaled $4,545 adjusting for inflation. On top of that, they had, their dues were higher than ours for 15 years, from 2005 to 2019. Adjusting for inflation, that number totaled about almost $7,000 more. So adding those together, the assessments for nine years and the 15 years of being dues higher than us, that's about almost, that's $11,510. They've paid more than we have from 2005 to 2019. So again, all that gobbledygook now is in a, in a nice colorful slide. And I'll describe that. And so what you have is the box at the top, the green box at the top. Well, no, I'm not gonna start with that. I'm gonna start with the blue line. That's the top line. That's HOA1's dues. You can see where it's higher than ours for those 15 years. We're the red line. It crossed over, as I said, in 2020. And now you can see that the gap is accelerating. The orange part is basically that $11,500. The box at the top, which we'll get to later, shows that once the assessments at HOA 1 were finished in 2014, they started flattening the dues because they didn't have those big needs for their renovations that they were doing because they're 10 years older than we are. And the box at the bottom basically also says 
the dues were $11,510 higher than ours for 15 years. Next slide. Okay, part four. Where do these estimates come from? Matt, hold up my four pound reserve study. I couldn't do it, it's too heavy. But I've been carrying it around and studying it. Um, th those estimates, the 45 to 50 million, come from two sources. The reserve study, and the reserve study, is, as Matt said, uh, we do it every three years, has a 30 year time horizon, lists 598 material components. Material means it's worth $5,000 or more and has a, a useful life of more than three years. Um, we're measured against national databases. But what we've learned is that because of the Arizona weather, our assets age faster than the national databases. Hence some of the problem that we're having now. Um, we also, I'll skip down to the bottom, we also used a more recent estimate for the Gulf, the, preserva uh, the preserve renovation. It's based on two professional estimates, Mike Ogle Design and Troon. They gave us some updated estimates about $9 million. Next slide. So, where are, our, where are our reserves going to be spent? Over the next 10 years, we'll have many large projects. One half of our roads are going to reach 30 years of age and need attention. We have three tennis courts, as I mentioned. Initial construction was not suitable, cheap construction. They weren't done with post-tension, need to be replaced. It's a safety issue. Our common area maintenance facility, we really don't have one. We want to combine that with our CIF, the preserve golf course irrigation pump replacement, and the preserve, preserve golf course renovation. There's no hiding this. And also repay our Mountain View debt. As of this month, the principal balance outstanding is $5,052,000. If we carry this through to maturity, we're going to pay an extra $783,000 in interest. Next slide. So here's our pie chart. I'll pause and let you look at this. The pieces of the pie that are yellow is golf. That's 46%. But it's not all one thing. It's three different things. 11% is our golf equipment. We've got four and a half to $5 million of equipment we need to buy over the next 10 years. The golf loan, which I just mentioned, that's 12%. And the golf courses. That's 23%. Most of that is the preserve renovation. Whether it's done sooner or later, it's going to get done. What's interesting, which I thought, which I circled, is the golf courses at 23% equal the roads. That tended to a million dollars. Then the Mountain View Complex, property site, which is gutters, walls, those types of things. 9%, then the Desert View, and the clubhouse at the preserve, about 4%. Next slide, Rick. So, just a rehash of what we described, this reserve analysis group from our December 13th presentation. Uh, we assembled a panel of finance committee members and advisors to develop strategies, scenarios for reserve expenditures in the next 10 years, explore the funding options for best possible outcomes. That includes dues increases, both aggressive and moderate, to match annual expenditure needs, special assessments, which is what we're talking about today, that jumpstart the fund to avoid future debt and large dues increases, or a combination of all of the above. We also research expenditure timing, move things forward, push them back, what's the best thing for everyone, and also almost job number one, the prepayment of the Mountain View Golf Course Loan. Next slide. Using reasonable and prudent assumptions, integrated models were developed given our policy CCNR's limitations, incorporating both operating fund and reserve fund expenditures. A 3% annual inflation factor was applied through 2033. That's where we are now for inflation. We created multiple scenarios, primarily affecting the reserve fund, which is what I want. This is the crux of what we're talking about today is the reserve fund. We came down from many, many options down to three that seemed to be the most viable. One of them, a six board approved smaller assessments, if you will, 
and a new loan for the preserve irrigation system, about $5 million. Option two, six board approved assessments without a loan for the preserve irrigation system. Or option three, one community approved, you all voting approving it, of assessments, of one assessment paid over four years with no new loan. That's the $4,600. Next slide. So, what I just said for those three options, here they are kind of mapped out, possible outcomes. You can see the green line at the top, that's the top line, at the, the years 24 through 27. That's adding in the $4,600 assessment over four years. Then the dues drop materially in 2028 and flatten out. If you use one of the other options, options with a loan, that's the middle line. You can see smaller dues increases in the beginning years, but at the end, much higher dues for several years and doesn't quite flatten out because of interest on the loan. And then the uh, other loan, the purple line, which is the top line at the end on the right-hand side, you can see six years of dues assessments and then much higher dues at the end of the road. So, next slide, Rick. So can you, one more? There. So what this gives us with an assessment, whether it's many small ones or one large one, pay over four years, is financial flexibility at the ending years of the decade. A decrease, and it gives us ways to diminish or flatten their dues. A decrease in the annual reserve fund allocation could ameliorate any pressure from an increased need for dues to operate the community from an ordinary inflation or factor, which means you can reduce the allocation of the reserve fund and yearly dues and push it over into the operating fund. A board approved option has many smaller assessments for many, well, let me skip that, go back one. There, this is really what I'm trying to say clumsy way. This table shows basically option number two, smaller assessments without a loan, and option three, community approved assessment. You can see that the early years with number three, the allocation to the reserve fund is much higher in the mid to high 40s. And then it drops all the way down to 24%. If you look at the smaller assessment without a loan, it starts at with the $300 assessment, $3,800 this year. But the assessment allocation to the reserve is about 45% in 28 and only falls at 30%. So these are the dials. If you want to look at it as dials, you can dial back the allocation to the reserve fund once the assessment period is over. That gives the financial flexibility to keep dues stable or even flat, like HOA1 did in that previous slide. So part seven. Okay, on December 13th, we had a town hall. We put it out for comments, 30 day comment period, video replay, I just looked it up, we had 955 views on the replay. 77 res residents responded during the 30 day period. We had 187 comments. 15, were to postpone or reduce preserve reset. 13 were in favor of larger assessments, option three, if you will. There's a concern over financially challenged residents. That's something that can be concerned about. Nine people said they had their wanted facilities other than golf having attention. We had eight people who had loan issues, pay off the loan. Six people who said close or sell one or both of the golf courses. Six people said create a park in the preserve. Six people said they object to paying for facilities they don't use. And then we had kind of a hodgepodge of everything else. 187 comments. So, part eight. Almost there. Talk about other remedies. Given some thought about selling one or, or both golf courses. Realistically, we've talked to two golf companies, True and Invited. Invited is the largest owner of private golf courses in the country. 
They, released, they said realistically, neither course is sellable as a standalone golf course. Why? One reason, likely no clubhouse would go with the sale, unless you want to sell the preserved clubhouse to go with the preserved golf course. What are you really buying if you're going to be a, a buyer? Basically 18 holes of golf, raw land, or not raw land, but land. We just spent $6 million on the Mountain View renovation. We couldn't recover our cost. And the preserved course is aged and in need of substantial investment to bring it to industry standards before anybody credible even look at it. So, how about turning the preserved golf course into a park? I assume this meant like a city park. So the maintenance costs would continue to be significant because you still got to mow the grass, fertilize it, seed it, irrigate it, trim it, um, still need maintenance equipment. Plus, you lose revenue since no golf would be played and have an adverse impact on surrounding home values. How do we know that? Because it was in discussion before. In 2019, Kenyatta Hills community was thinking about having its golf courses closed. They did a, they commissioned an appraisal and the impact study came back and said we, the surrounding homes could lose anywhere from 4 to 18% of their home value. So, how about repurposing the course into a desert park? Maintenance costs would transfer from the golf maintenance to the common area. I don't have estimates on what that would be. The loss, you still get the loss of revenue since no golf is played. That's about a million and a half dollars a year. The adverse effect on surrounding home values People pay upwards of 30% premium for golf course lots, national average. Litigation risks, high. Homeowners would sue because they paid that premium for their golf course lot. Plus there's a significant cost if natural desert plants were to be planted. This is 2006 study, put the cost at anywhere from $4,000 to $20,000 an acre. In today's dollars, that's anywhere from $500,000 to $2.5 million of front costs. Or, another alternative is to left it, if left to restore naturally, it could take years, but it risks looking like, next couple of pictures here. This is, this is true, this has actually happened, I can't pronounce, Awataki Lakes. Next picture, that, this is what the homeowners would be, who would be looking at from their homes. At the preserve, million dollar homes. So, kind of a final admonition here, if you will. The board cannot knowingly make decisions that adversely affect home values. That means you gotta, if you're gonna sell one or more of the golf courses, turn it into a park, city park, or turn it into a nature preserve. A lot of thought has to go into that. And now, finally, part nine. Which path to follow? Going back to our metaphor of a fork in the road, our replacement reserve fund is behind by an estimated $4,600 per resident, meeting our planned near-term reserve expenditures to, to avoid several years of aggressive, anti-competitive future dues increases. Next slide, Rick. Okay. After examining all the analysis that's been done, looking at every conceivable angle, and given our limited abilities to raise funds, it boils down to only a couple of options. An upfront community approved special assessment of around $4,600 per residence, payable over four years, followed by smaller than otherwise annual dues increases, or the alternative, the HOA1 model. Many years of board approved smaller assessments in addition to aggressive dues increases. Of the three options, viable options came up with one has a loan and one does not have a loan. A couple of benefits of the upfront assessment. We could retire the Mountain View debt in early 2025 and save $450,000 in interest. We could move to preserve renovation to 2027 from 2029 and save almost $600,000 assuming a 3% inflation rate. And lastly, I'll go back to that, one more. Lastly, go back to this slide with which road, which path do you care to follow? I guess the choice is yours. You guys get to decide. That is it for me, Matt. Thanks, Campbell. 
How we doing over there? Doing all right? All right. My thoughts. Well, I could recap what Campbell just told you, but he did it eloquently, more eloquently than I would. We need to complete this reserve fund catch up for the reasons he stated. I'll take a million dollars worth of savings. We never get credit for trying to save you all money. We're trying desperately to figure that out in this exercise. Next slide. I'm gonna take us to the focus groups and the feedback we got and explain to you the questions I'm gonna to attempt to tackle here today because you all asked some tough questions. But the focus groups gave us a great deal of feedback. As a matter of fact, I don't know how long I'm gonna be processing data, but I hope to have it done by the time we get done with these town halls. But there are common themes related to people's comments, questions, and suggestions. Next slide. So we conducted six focus groups. We broke them down into seasonal residents, year-round residents, Residents who lived in the villas, who were interested in getting their perspective. Residents who owned their homes here five years or less, six to 14 years, and those folks that have been here for 15 years or longer. We had a facilitation team led by Maureen Spence, Ray Adams, and Charlie Shawless. That was the three-person team that accepted the challenge I won't say execute, to conduct our focus groups. And as I said, we got lots of data. So Ray took all that data and he broke it down into 13 buckets. And I'm gonna answer each one of these. I'll run through them very quickly. Why don't you increase the rates for golf fees? Why doesn't the board use the capital improvement fund to fund the replacement reserve fund? Why don't we establish an F&B minimum charge for all homeowners? Why doesn't the board sell or close a golf course? My answer won't be any more articulate than Campbell's, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Why can't the board delay the preserve renovation? Why doesn't the board make ropes and pay for the preserve renovation? I would love them to fix out the uh, Outlook Drive Road up there to fell in this week. That ain't happening. Why doesn't the board repair, replace assets by need, not want? Next slide. Why don't the two HOAs merge? Why doesn't the board outsource operations? Why doesn't the board reduce our amenities or charge those who use them more? What authority does the board have to take out loans? And what loans do we have outstanding? And what has the board and management done to reduce cost? And finally, what is the board going to do for people who cannot afford an assessment? So let's visit. Next slide. Why don't we increase golf rates? If you live in HOA 2, your annual is $4,400. Next door at HOA 1, it's $3,780. Out at the ranch, it's $3,700. And down the street at the views, it's $3,995. What most of you don't know is that we already have 107 Saddlebrook II residents who buy their annuals at HOA 1, costing us $470,000 of revenue. Now there's a reason why our residents chose to go play golf somewhere else. When the migration started, it was probably due to the eroding golf course conditions and the kind of service they received from the Robeson team. Well, we've been in charge, this is now six years, and um, we just got the investment completed at Mountain View. 
and we haven't made the investment in the preserve. Those 107 annuals aren't coming back until our courses rival HOA1s. That's the economic reality your board faces. Higher fees will only drive the 303 loyal annual members we have to other options. And I want you to think about this. If you're a couple playing golf here and buying annuals, you're paying over $8,000 a year for the privilege of playing on our courses. That's why we can't raise our dues any higher than we've already raised them. I'm sorry, our golf rates. Next slide. Why doesn't the board use the capital improvement fund to fund the replacement reserve fund? Some people think that's a good idea. I've heard from a lot of you. The reserve fund has a specific purpose, as does the capital improvement fund. In 2016, when our homeowners approved the implementation of the capital improvement fund, it was specifically focused on delivering something new that wasn't already here. When you take the funds and you reallocate them to another purpose than which they are intended, then you have no ability to do the things that the authorities were granted by establishing that fund. And that was done through our CC and ours. And so, the two funds have different purposes. And we have lawyers. In the, the legal interpretation, it would not be illegal to move those funds, but it would be a purpose violation. And we know today that there are needs for our CIF funds. Now having said all of that, we're having a lot of cussing and discussing going on at the board level, right? We have not declared ourselves on this issue yet. What you just got was the book answer for why we can't do this. I will let you know that it's under further study and will be a subject of our next working meeting focused specifically on this problem set. More to follow. Why don't we establish an F&B minimum charge for all homeowners? You already got it. It's called the subsidy. Oh, that was a snide remark. Um, our legal counsel has advised that our CCNRs, as they exist today, prohibit the board from pursuing this strategy. If Robeson were to approve a change to our CCNRs, it would require a majority of homeowners to approve the change. The board is intent on focusing on improving the food and service offering to generate more revenue. Thank you for that. Because I have to say this, if I haven't made this clear today, subsidies are a part of resident decision making. It's our community. It's our community. We need you to support that food operation. That's how we're gonna drive the subsidy down. And my dream, if I'm, where's Hank? If I can be here as long as Hank, my dream is that we'll have HOA1 people fighting to play on our golf courses. Why doesn't the board sell or close a golf course? This is a popular theme. Uh, if you don't play golf, this is an easy target. The overriding responsibility of the board of directors is to create policies and operate the association in a way that will maintain, protect, and enhance the value of the assets of the members. I personally, this is Cambic, just one of seven, I interpret that to preserve the values of your homes. Closing a golf course will have an adverse impact 
on home values. The board cannot pursue this action. We cannot sell our golf courses. Campbell didn't get into all the details, but when you operate at a loss, there's no profit incentive. We have no clubhouses to sell with our golf courses. And invited firmly laughed at us and told us why they wouldn't buy the golf courses. And oh, by the way, close the preserve golf course. There'll be no lawsuits connected to that. Why can't the board delay the preserve renovation? Already has. It already has. We're in year 28 of Mountain View existence and we're getting ready. We're getting ready to open it up for play later this spring. In 2024, we're in the 21st year of operations of the preserve golf course. In 2027, we'll be in the 24th year. And in 2029, we'll be in the 26th year. The irrigation life cycle is expected in our climate is expected to be 20 years. The bunker life cycle was supposed to be rebuilt at 12. The greens at 15. The pump station life cycle has come and gone. The TDEX life cycle has come and gone. These are industry standards. These are not anything that your board develops and makes up on their own. And if I can put one more nail in this deal, Troon was here this week, the vice president of construction and our lead agronomist for our region were here to do an evaluation of the preserve. And I think Dan, well, maybe Dan won't be talking about that Wednesday, but Dan will be talking about it soon when we get the report back from them on their analysis of the preserved golf course. Next question. Why doesn't the board make ropes and pay for the preserve renovation? Now I heard you chuckling, but some people think that's a real question. We negotiated, our community negotiated a transition agreement with RCI. We transitioned effective 1 January 2018. The homeowners, the members of the corporation of our HOA assume responsibility for maintenance of our assets at that point. Now we didn't fully appreciate that. I'm going to give you the, uh, and nobody had a crystal ball to see what was racing at us. But racing it did and it's here. So Robeson's not fixing our roads that are falling in. We're going to fix them. We're going to fix them as quickly as we can. But there's no going back on Robeson. Campbell said something to me today that was very astute. And what you said was, in those transition documents, his lawyers were tilting everything towards his benefit. I think he was right. Well, I'm glad this ropes and thing, it, it, it resonates with you all. Okay, next question. Why doesn't the board repair or replace assets by need, not want? Well, I have to tell you, both the board and the management team use a deliberate process each year of open budget meetings to review all reserve fund requirements. In that process, it's very common for the board and the management team to either push projects out or to pull projects forward based on critical need. Now I say this with all the love I can muster. Most of you don't know about that process because there ain't nobody in the room when we do it. That's the truth, the God awful truth. We go through a very deliberate process to put that budget together. Next slide. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, next slide. <laughs> One of my favorites. Why don't the two HOAs merge? Yeah. 
Thank you, Rick. Why don't the two HOAs merge? If I had a magic wand, the two boards issued a joint statement dated April 28, 2022, addressing this topic. In it, both boards confirmed their commitment to work closely together on common points of interest. They stated the following on why the merger was not feasible and or advisable in their memo. The financial and legal issues involved are immeasurable. The amendment clause of Saddlebrook 2 CCRs are an obstacle due to RCI's declaration that they will not allow any major changes to the CCRs until all of their lots are sold in HOA 2. We still have 100 plus lots to go. The claims of the cost savings attached to consolidating the two HOAs were, were unsubstantiated. And the challenges associated with negotiating a merger and satisfying all of the special interest groups would be a long and protracted exercise. So I got, um, what was our last get together? Um, governance, the governance conference. Someone asked a question about what we're doing with HOA 1. We're working, we're working hard with HOA 1 to have a conversation about the future of these two communities as, and how we, how we market this place post Robeson. Because that day's coming, it's running at us. And we're very much interested in engaging in this dialogue with our brothers and sisters next door. Why doesn't the board outsource operations? Well, in 2022, the board outsourced golf management to Club Corps, which became invited. And on July 1st, 23, Troon assumed our contract when they bought Invited's course management portfolio. No other operations have been outsourced at this time, but it doesn't mean that the board won't consider those opportunities in the future. Next slide. Why doesn't the board reduce our amenities or charge those who use them more? Residents understand that a wide range of amenities are vital to the community, although the importance of any one amenity other than the theater is not universal. This came back to us from the survey through the McMahon Group, and one of the significant takeaways in that entire process is what I described earlier when we started, we got a lot of people that enjoy a lot of things. We just don't all enjoy the same thing. But what you said was, you recognize the importance of having that wide range of opportunities available in our community. For the people that want us to eliminate amenities, would yours be first? Who would decide on what we eliminate? And it's beyond our responsibility as a board to even go down that road. Everything that's here is our responsibility to maintain on your behalf. We are all members of the Saddlebrook HOA2 Corporation. We live in a common interest community where we have the responsibility, the collective responsibility to maintain all the assets of our corporation. We don't get to pick and choose, and we, the board, don't get to discriminate against any of the residents who live in our community. Next slide. What authority does the board have to take out loans, and what loans do we have outstanding? Well, our authority comes from the CCNRs. And if I had Mark up here, he'd be waxing philosophically about the broad powers that your board has that are conveyed within the CCNRs. Article 9, use of funds, borrowing power, is where the authority comes from. In Section 2, it states, the association may borrow money in such amounts 
at such rates, upon such terms and security, and for such periods of time as is necessary or appropriate in the discretion of the board. We as a corporation currently have one loan outstanding. It's the Mountain View Renovation Loan. The name of the lender, Western Alliance Bank. The amount, $6 million. The monthly payment, $119,000, for my brother Bill. Annual total, we pay $1,428,000. $978.48. Somebody wanted to know this. The loan payback total is $7,144,892.40. The term of the loan is five years. The interest rate was 7%. There is no prepayment penalty. Thus, part of our strategy going forward is to save you some money and pay that dang thing off. What has the board and management done to reduce cost? It's gonna take me three slides to get through this. The first is the performance of value engineering of all the items associated with the reserve replacement that we look at on an annual basis. This leads to the push and pull of projects. It is the staff that does the analysis that tells us that we can defer projects or we have a critical matter that we have to deal with that wasn't yet in the window. We evaluate trade-off of internal versus external resources to complete projects or tasks. When we did the Rincon room renovation earlier this year, I'm sorry, that was last year, that renovation was done solely by our staff. We have an in-house HVAC technician that provides all of our preventative maintenance and repair. Obviously, in this community, that would be significant. We have an in-house kitchen appliance technician that does all of our preventative maintenance and repair. We recently had Real Foods in here, a consulting firm looking at our food and beverage operation. Chuck is leading the charge for us on. And in the outbrief that Dan and I sat through, they were impressed by our kitchen, the maintenance of our equipment, and how clean it was during their visit. I say that to you so you know, there's some real effort going into making your food and beverage experience better. We have energy efficiency activities. We replaced the windows at Mountain View. More energy replacement win er, windows. HVAC energy gains. We're using higher SEER ratings on the equipment we're using. We have Wi-Fi enabled thermostats. We had an energy task force that set the uh, guidance for where those thermostats could be set. 71 for cooling, 77 for heating, or I'm sorry, maybe it's the other way around. Water efficiency gains. Next slide. Our pools. This year in 2024, we're implementing a solar heating program to heat the Mountain View pool. We've installed ultraviolet disinfecting on our spas to reduce chlorine usage. Chlorine is costly. We're investigating leading edge disinfecting technologies to reduce chlorine usage at all of our pools. We've installed solar power on Mountain View's parking canopy to support the Arts and Crafts building. We consolidated our security systems to one provider in contract, gaining cost efficiencies. And our management tools, much the same way. With our new technologies, with North Star, we're able to eliminate a number of other assets, management tools we were using. Next slide. We've installed LED lighting across our community. I've already talked to you about the golf course stuff. I won't belabor that. We did put covers over our rental golf cart fleets to reduce damage that was caused by the sun and the rain and reduce our maintenance costs that we were experiencing. 
Next slide. What is the board going to do for people who cannot afford an assessment? I got asked this question when I ran for the board. Ron Betschke. I'll bet Ron's out here somewhere. And I knew Ron was going to ask that question again today. Um, and my answer hasn't changed. First of all, from the CCR's perspective, we treat all homeowners the same, without distinction. Anything that other than that approach is unacceptable in our or any HOA's governance. So there's the book answer for what we can and cannot do. The truth is, that's a problem set I have no answer for. Next slide. So my closing thoughts for you before we go to you. We as a community have questions to answer. Do we want to pay off the Mountain View loan? Save $450,000. Do you want to support moving the preserve renovation forward two years and save an additional $595,000? Do you want a solution for this challenge that's going to control our annual HOA dues to make our community more attractive for future home buyers. Next slide. This is our vision statement. To be the premier active adult community of choice in Southern Arizona, for that to happen, we have to come together. Our next steps, next slide. I've asked for a board working meeting for next week because the members of this board are still challenging one another on what it is we ask of you. And so we gotta get through it all and we gotta, we gotta have our arm wrestling and we gotta dig deeper and we gotta answer questions on what, what we think is truly the very best information and ideas that we can provide to you. The bottom line is we have to declare ourselves. Following that, on the 20th of February, is going to be the next town hall. We're going to continue to take the information that we've got. We're going to continue to analyze it. I'm going to continue, we, the board, are going to continue to challenge Campbell and the RRA group. Their work is not finished. Uh, you all keep asking hard questions. We're going to find more answers. We've got another town hall early in March. And one way, the, one way or the other, we're going to voting in mid-March. Next slide. I told you at the beginning of this presentation today that we were filming it. It will be available online. The slides will be made available for you. And we're going to open up another question comment window for a couple of weeks. So based on what you've heard here today, based on all that we've provided to you and we'll discuss with you, you can still continue to dialogue with us. Next slide. Now it's your turn. I'm gonna sit down and it's your turn to bring your questions to us. Thank you very much. Uh, do you want names and do you want units? Also, oh, so the mic. Yeah, since no one can come up. Hello, my name is Keith Schuller. Schuller, I'm in unit 44A. My name is Keith Schuller. I am in unit 44A. I would urge you to have these debts paid off as, as soon as possible. The way that I... The way that I look at, at this, we are akin to a full-service country, country club that also maintains roads. When I see country club dues, they're far in excess of what we are paying. I'm not adverse to having subsidies for the different activities that I'm not taking part of, because those activities are part of a whole that brings the greatness 
to what Savile Brook is. And what I would like to see is where we pay it off sooner. As a matter of fact, if you're able to, please arrange that for those who want to even prepay, that they could get lien releases or reductions in their later payments so they don't have to bear interest for money they don't really want to borrow. Yet I recognize also that there are people who cannot afford increases. I would try to rationalize your uh, worry about, different, about not treating people differently by allowing anyone to be part of a borrowing program if they qualify. So if someone is of an income interest or an asset level that is below that which allows them to pay the increase amounts, where they would borrow, they would pay interest. That could be available to anyone, just that certain people wouldn't be able to borrow it because they don't have the need. In, in any event, I would urge that you have this paid off sooner than later. These are problems I don't like deficit spending at the federal level, at the state level, or the HOA level. Thank you. Michael Nickerson. Really get hey, on. Joey, could you start the two-minute thing? There you go. Or <laughs> somewhere. A two-minute thing. Okay. Um, Mike Nickerson, Unit 24, Lot 30. Um, I appreciate the information because you answered almost all of the questions I was going to ask. However, it took an awful lot longer than you needed to, and we're not going to have as much time questioning. I still would like you to look again at the preserve sale. I know what you said, but and the property values, however, in HOA 2 will continue to be depressed because we are anti-competitive right now. And either way we go, it looks like we will be for the next 10, 15 years. So we need to do something more than what you said. But I do appreciate how you were able to answer. I had five questions. You answered four of them really well. Thank you. I'll use his time, too. No. My name is Rebecca Muha, and my husband and I just moved here a year and a half ago. Love it. Um, but I'm... I don't know Rebecca, if you guys... what's your unit number? Please? Unit 23. Thank you. Yes. Um, since we're so new here, I don't know if Saddlebrook has ever hosted a, like a golf tournament or anything, something that might generate real interest and some extra income. Many I don't times. know if that's a viable many idea. Times, many times. Oh, you have? Several. Oh, oh okay. All right, well, let's do more. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Rebecca. My name is William O'Leary. I'm in the Unit 24. I have two issues uh, with what I saw today. One is that uh, when you showed the, uh, the uh, three assessment curves, this was uh, predicated upon the assumption that you're going to spend $6 million or so on the preserve up front. It's not taking that money out. So those assessments are really focused upon uh, continuing the, the spending on the preserve. The second thing is maybe a little bit more ethereal in that. Is, is golf dying? Is, is, is it worth taking and, and uh, uh, spending these monies on something that's dying? And the second question is, how is our, our golf course, our HOA golf course, is competitive in this environment? Um, I was reading the Arizona tax statutes, and they have a very simple way of determining this. It's called assessing economic obsolescence. And, and when you file your taxes here in the HOA, you have to give this to the, to the tax assessor. And it's very simple. You, took at the, you look at the maximum capacity of the golf courses you have, just maximize out, and then look at the actual rounds played. And that ratio is your, your economic uh, uh, obsolescence thing. And I suspect if we went back 10 years or so, we'd see a, 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 maybe a frightening uh, curve in the sense that we are becoming more and more economically obsolete in terms of uh, taking and, and supporting these courses in the way we are. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'm David Stryker from Unit uh, 32. Um, as a general comment, uh, golf course architecture is a subjective artistic exercise and no two architects will come, come up with the same plan for a given piece of land. And if you ask one architect to comment on another architect's work, I think you're always going to come up with a long list of suggested changes or preferences. How, how confident is this board that the new architect we have hired um, is just substituting his preferences for those of the architect that designed the course originally? In other words, once we get this all done, if we hired another consultant, would that person say, there's another 40 things you need to have done? Kent Adams, Unit 25, Lot 6. A couple quick points. One, it seems unusual to project the reserve funds out when we haven't completed the strategic analysis, which will create another layer of expenses and needs over the long haul. I would request that that be looked at because if we have a strategic plan that requires X spending uh, and we haven't funded it, what are we doing to ourselves? And then second is I'm really requesting Campbell to look at communities around South Arizona and look at how their food, beverage, golf operations are, because there are a number of Robson communities similar to us that are running them operationally at break even. If we do that for 10 years, that solves a huge chunk of our <clears throat> shortfall in capital funding. So by cutting your expenses and cutting the subsidies through better operational methods, we should be looking at that and saying, what can we do? Good. My name is Jill Staker, Unit 32. Um, nice job on putting together the presentation and all the hard work you put into the numbers. Uh, you mentioned uh, you, you added inflation over the 10-year period for these projects. Um, I, my question, one of my questions is, uh, what kind of contingency did you put in for the unexpected things? I never heard of, maybe I missed it, maybe you've got it in there. But if a project this side doesn't have contingency, you're never going to make it. The second point or question I have is who's the general or the dictator that's going to be in charge of this project for 10 years? Because you've got to have a really tough individual. And I think most of you know that. Uh, most of you probably have dealt with large projects before. But you gotta have somebody that's really tough because there's gonna be a lot of, oh, I wanna add this, uh, we don't need to do this. And you gotta have somebody that's uh, almost like a general and he has sole, and that's his sole job. It can't be somebody's part-time job. It certainly could not be the board's. Um, and uh, I think that's all I have. That's the main thing. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Bill Mead. I live in Unit 45, Lot 118. I appreciate all the work that you're going to have to do to make these things happen. Um, and I'm not here to tell you to reduce anything. I think we need to spend some money. We've got to keep up this facility, if we're gonna reach anything like the vision statement that you have put out. And I think we are falling behind badly. All you have to do is go up to the ranch, have, left, have dinner at the ranch, go through their, their uh, arts and crafts center. The only thing that we have, in, have that's comparable is the reserve, excuse me, the preserve uh, restaurant. So I th my concern is how the money is being spent proportionally. Uh, and I think we'll have to admit that the golf course, particularly the preserve, is the, it's the elephant in the room. What are you gonna do about that? I don't think you can sell it. I think you both have spelled out a lot of the problems with it. 
But I have one suggestion I'd like to make, and it's not something that I came up with. It comes from a book. The book is titled The Big Thirst, and it was written by a man named Charles Fishman. Interesting name, considering he wrote a book on water. At any rate, he talks about a lot of uh, communities that had to deal with water. And one in particular that I think is relevant to us is Las Vegas. They've got a huge water problem. They take their water up Lake Mead, which is disappearing. So one of the golf courses, <coughs> golf courses in, um, in the Las Vegas area called Angel Park decided to take an aggressive approach. They removed not 10% of their turf, 30%. And then by doing that, they reduce a lot of costs. Water, seed, chemicals, labor, how much you're gonna put into uh, <clears throat> irrigation, all of that. You could probably reduce to zero the amenities on golf, those costs, simply by doing that. Well, of course, it looks a little weird to have a, a bunch of desert in the middle of a golf course. Looks a little weird to have a golf course in the middle of a desert. I, I live over on 13, I, I walk around 14. You've got a par three, you're supposed to drive the green, you've got grass all the way from the tee box to the, to the tee, or to the green. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, if you can't drive pretty close to the green, you shouldn't be playing golf. I mean, Take up something that a little easier to learn, like quantum mechanics. We need some creative thinking. We can't just say, eh, a little of this, a little of that. We need to spread the money more evenly. Mike Dunbar. Unit 17, lot 147. I was actually on one of the focus groups, focus group number four. Residents that have been here less than five years. Mike, um, can you talk closer to the mic, please? <clears throat> sure. Um, I just have a couple of questions. The first one is, and, and I have to make this statement, and it, you know, I have to disagree with Matt. I think some mistakes were made. I don't blame the board, the current board, for any of those mistakes, but some mistakes were made early on. By, by, two golf courses for a million dollars each with less than six years of life left in them is probably not a good idea, but I, dig I digress. So my first question is, you say we have a choice about how these assessments are gonna go, but yet at the bottom of each of these options, it says the payments cited are preliminary. Work is still in progress. How are we gonna vote on something that is preliminary? We need to have final data. We don't need our vote to go to something that we're expecting and then in five years, oh, all of a sudden we, we're in a shortage again and we need to raise our dues again. I don't agree with that at all. This should have been, this should have been researched and, and finalized and said this is what your options are. The other part of that is you say we have an option. Well, the only option we have is to vote for number three. And if we don't vote it, the board is going to decide between option one and option two and we have no say in that. I don't agree with that at all. We, we, we elected you as our board to be the voice of the people, and when the people speak, you have to listen to what they're saying and you have to abide by what they want because that's what we hired you for. I know you're not paid, but you know what I mean. We, we, we don't really have a choice in my opinion. We're either going to vote for that 4,600 or we're going to not, and you're going to pick whichever you want, so. Well, last, I hope not least, uh, Marv Goldberg. Um, I am, was, a marketer. And What's your unit? Uh, sorry, uh, 27. Thank you. Um, the market data shows that there are slowly or quickly, fewer and fewer golfers coming on stream with younger people. We have excess, you don't have to be a marketer, you just have to be staring at the golf course, which we do, to know there's excess capacity at man in view. 
You showed pictures of a dried out walking area. That is a straw man. There are lovely walking areas developed in all kinds of places. I have not done a study, but randomly people, maybe more predominantly with dogs, but without, say we wish we had walking paths. The preserve could be a beautiful oasis for walkers, tranquil, with a few benches here and there for people to sit and read a book. There's nothing negative about that. Are there going to be lawsuits? So be it. <laughs> well, just to be intimidated, to be intimidated a priori and not go down that path is a mistake, I think. Thank you. Uh, Marie Gordon, and I'm in Unit 36, Lot 52, and I'm pretty much here just to give a statement. I've only been, you're doing this, so can you hear me? <laughs> I've only been uh, in Saddlebrook for three years, and uh, when I was first here, yes, the dues was quite a bit lower, and I have heard in the past that, yes, there was mistakes made, and, but we are beyond that now. We are here, and this is what we have to deal with. And so I feel that we need to take option three, only because it's going to save us a half a million dollars down the road. And everybody came here for a reason. You might have come here for golf. You might have come here for pickleball. You might have come here for the arts or tennis. But we all came for a reason. And at, you know, I'm, I am a golfer. I'm not a great golfer, but I'm a golfer. But to me, giving up the golf course is not the answer. We will not get other golfers in this community. We will not be looked at seriously if we get rid of our amenities that we have now. And one other statement about having our dues go up and voting for that option. There are a lot of people here from California. And if they had an HOA there, they know that the dues is about 12,000. That's 12,000 a month. Do we want our dues to continually go up 12,000? So it's, um, it's a little crazy. So, or 1,200, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me restate that, 1,200. I do know people that are paying $1,200 a month. So, um, and, that was one reason I came to this community, is that the HOA dues were low. And now we're talking about extending them and never going back down. Thank you. I appreciate everything you guys have done. Uh, good afternoon, Joe Coachella, Unit uh, 48135. I'll do this quick. Golf. When we purchased the golf courses, we, uh, we purchased an unfunded liability that wasn't properly reserved. And that's why we're in this position today. Uh, I couldn't get in because they wouldn't let me in until about 10 minutes ago. 25% um, uh, of the 40 to 55 million 10 year plan, 25% of that is due to the preserved golf course rebuild of $12 million. I think we got to look at that. Um, and uh, moving on, intent to developer, peak demand. The residents of Saddlebrook want to have, be able to do what, what they want, when they want, at all, at, at basically in a four hour period. The, the, intent of the, the intent of the developer was to have a vast array of, of amenities. So if you would go use the gym or the pickleball or the tennis and spread it out throughout the day, demand, demand softens and it becomes less of a problem. All right, moving on, e economic reality. We can't build this community for peak demand. If we do, the cost will be escalated by two or three of what we're currently paying. It's just n not fiscally feasible. And then the third thing I'd like to say is personal responsibility. What can each of us do to lessen the demand? So when COVID hit, I'll give you an example of what me and my wife did. When COVID hit, 
we bought an indoor bike. So we never let her had to go to the gym and we didn't want to be around people, no offense, at that time anyway. We also bought a treadmill, we got a Pilates machine. So I know Matt, I think Matt thinks that the uh, gym at the preserve is too small, and it is small. I don't know the intent of the developer, but I suspect that that space was there when he built the building and he said, well, what are we gonna do with that? Well, he probably said, well, let's put some equipment in there and people will have another choice. But we have the gym at Jesuit View and you have uh, HOA One's gym. I've, been, I, I've, I've visited personally, me and my wife, nine communities. Our gym at the Desert View is pretty good size. I've seen some like, like a, a half that size at, at places I visited. I only seen one community that had a larger gym than us. But anyway, that's all I have to say. I appreciate everything you do. Oh no, I do have one more thing to say. <laughs> well, wait a minute, and this is it. I think we should have a plebiscite, a community vote on how much money we want to spend going forward on the preserve because it's the residents community and the residents should have a right to that vote. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Uh, Lori LeClaire, Unit 17. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Oh, sweet Jesus. I didn't Jesus. get the name. Lori LeClaire, Unit 17. Thank you. I'm curious about other ways of cost saving. Specifically, I want to know, what is the annual amount that the community subsidizes food service? The annual amount that, that we subsidize food and beverage? Yes. It, it varies um, from year to year. It's varied from just over 200,000. This last year is about 500,000. Subsidy. Okay, and what plans are being made to make those operations break even? Uh, there are a lot of plans. We've had a company come in and evaluate it right now, our operations, which uh, Matt had referred to. Um, we have uh, different focuses that we're having Alan, our food and beverage director, um, work on. So we're really waiting for the report from this um, evaluation, and that'll give us more focus on what we can do to um, in improve our food and beverage operations. I don't have any specifics right now for you. Okay, and if that goal of break even isn't achieved, are we looking to privatize? We never said the goal was to break even. The um, goal would reduce. not be to break even, but to have uh, the residents no, continue um, to subsidize it? Again, in these communities, the food and beverage operations aren't, aren't built to break even. So, but we are aiming to reduce the subsidy. Okay, it, ju it just seems odd with a fairly captive audience and having liquor licenses, it doesn't seem any reason why they shouldn't be self-supporting. So, just my comment. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, hello, my, uh, my name's Jerry Hack, Unit 36. I have a couple questions. First one is, uh, on these major projects, are you guys running ROIs on them, or how, you de how are you deciding whether to spend the money or not? Maybe Campbell would be the answer, if he would answer that. Every, every project gets analyzed in the budget process based on needs. First thing that happens is the staff does an analysis, all right? Yeah. Uh, we know what's going on with the golf courses. We don't need any analysis. Useful life comes and goes. When you're on the other side of it, it needs attention. And so I don't know if you're specifically asking about the golf course. You're I, asking about this new roof. I spent my life in manufacturing. And we always ran ROIs on projects. You're saying you need a new irrigation system. How much is it costing us to maintain that irrigation system, the existing one? And what's the payback on replacing it with a new one? That's the kind of questions I'm asking. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's a good question. New irrigation system in Mount View is going to last for 50 years. I'm talking about the preserve right now. It'll how last... much are you spending on repairing the preserve irrigation system? And how does that fit with the $7 million that you want to spend on it? Mark. 
How much is the irrigation system? Five million? Yeah. Yeah, the uh, irrigation, I guess, is, uh, I mean, it's projected uh, based on estimates we've got now. It's about four and a half million for preserve in 2027. Uh, one thing I wanted to clarify, though, is ROI doesn't come into play when it comes to assets for an HOA. ROI is a corporate thing. I've worked for a corporation for 43 years. We're talking about keeping our home values up, and we have to keep our, all of our amenities and our assets, whether it's roads or air conditioning, working. So you can't do an, I, you know, the only way you could do an analysis would be, okay, if we don't spend the money, what's it going to cost you in your home values? That's the ROI. So if we don't replace the roof here, and the roof fails, and we have to spend a million dollars to fix all the walls and the ceiling and the roof, that's going to be something you'll have to pay for. So what's the ROI for not replacing the roof for 100000 and spending a million to fix it after the roof fails? That is the ROI uh, calculation you'd have to make for every investment of an amenity that has a cost that if it fails, you're going to have to spend money one way or the other, or lose money, lose income. So you know, it's, little, it's a lot different than a corporation, a machine that's looking to invest in a machine where you're comparing efficiency for manpower, we're going to save this much manpower so we can spend a half a million on a machine. That financial analysis doesn't work in an HOA really at all unless you, you figure you, out some way of doing it. So. You're, you're investing in an irrigation system. That's a piece yeah. of equipment. Right. No, again, it's, it's a, an irrigation system that's required to keep an amenity up. So, okay. second question, yeah. and I know I'm past my time, but I remember when we decided to borrow the money, I think, Campbell, you thought that borrowing the money was not a bad idea, and now it's a bad idea. Why? Time's um, up. I was asked to arrange a loan for the Mountain View project. <laughs> In 2022, the first thing I was asked when I joined the board, August of 22, um, coming from my world of finance, debt is not a bad thing. Debt is a working capital line of credit. Now that people are older, they don't want to pay interest. That's fine. We can disagree. They don't want to pay interest. I have no problem paying back the loan early. I have no problem looking at all the options available to get this loan paid back as soon as possible. I have no problem with that. Thank you. Thank you. Dale, go ahead. Just a Thank you. I, first, I'd like to say this was a great presentation. However, uh, I have a statement. Uh, the board should present. What? Oh, my name is Charles Evans. I live in Unit 23. Uh, the uh, board should present their vision of golf specifically. Will the golf be re revenue neutral, which was stated multiple times during their presentations, or will, well, on why we should pr purchase the, the two golf courses, or will it require a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars a year. I think I know the answer to that. I would like to point out that um, there's always a statement, once fooled, your fault, fooled twice, my fault. There should be an option here. You gave us three choices. The fourth should be able to vote no. Hi, I'm Karen Bird. I currently have two homes here, not by choice, but anyway, 15 and 17 units. Um, I guess I have a question about the long-term viability of three golf courses. I hear, I'm not a golfer, so I have a biased opinion and I understand that. But there are other parts of the country that have found that the golf courses aren't viable. And they're choosing to close them and build new homes or build bigger other, um, like for instance, the physical fitness portion of Saddlebrook is absolutely fabulous. 
and we don't have enough room. And my thought is, I mean, I'm looking out way ahead because I know six years or 10 years is great, but in the long term, would it be smart to decide which one of our golf courses could be scaled back or made obsolete and use the land to create something that would make money for us. The, the fitness centers are doing great and our fees are going up and we're so happy with them that we're willing to do whatever we need to do. Um, just for future reference, long term, I don't know what the, I don't know, honestly, what the percentage of people that live here actually golf. Do any of you know? About 30. 30% out of 100%. That's all I'm gonna say. My name is Susan Williams. I live in Unit 24, Lot 29. I will pick up my mask after. I just think we need a little bit more information with the golf. Sun City sold one of their golf courses, or closed one of their golf courses, and their lot values went up. So shutting down a golf course does not necessarily mean that the value of your properties go down. And I think that it's the board's responsibility to look into that information more thoroughly. Thank you. I'm Les Goins. I'm in Unit 31, Lot 15. Uh, a, way to go on all the stuff you've done. Uh, wouldn't want to be there. Uh, the last couple of slides uh, talked about pushing some things forward. 500,000 here, six or 700,000 there, whatever it was. Uh, a, I would like that to be brought down to the person level. Is that going to change my dues by $11 if I say push it forward? Is it going to change my assessment by 100 bucks if I say push it forward? I think it looks like it's an easy thing for us to vote on to say push it forward. But we've also heard about so many times where the life expectancy of some of these assets has been exceeded. And it feels like, especially with the preserve golf course, et cetera, that this is another case where we're going to push that down the road and not deal with it now. Um, personally, I'm probably in the bottom 20% of all the uh, asset people here in this entire room. But I don't want to be here five years from now having the same discussion because we pushed it down the road one more time. I'd rather acknowledge what it is, forget about how we got here because it just is, and then just deal with it. Thank you. My name is Steve Lindquist, Unit 45, Lot 98. Um, I'm not quite sure where to start. There's so much to say. Um, first of all, we keep using the word maintain for reserves, okay? You just spent six and a half million dollars on a golf course. That wasn't maintenance. You were building a new course. That's what you basically did. I go back, I go back to the guy recently here just talked about, uh, you know, how much are you gonna spend on the preserve now? 9.8 million? I don't know what the real number is. I don't think you guys know what the real number is. But it's a big frickin' number. And I'm not sure that golf is going that way. Uh, from what I can determine, and there's been a lot of indications of that by people before me here today, I think we need to be real careful. We're talking about spending $16 million or thereabouts on two golf courses. Now, do we close a nine hole maybe? I mean, I don't know. There's a million things you can look at it. But, but you don't have to turn it into a damn desert either. I mean, you can make it nice as a walking facility or something else. It's not going to kill the home values. There's, there's a million things to do. But let's move on from that. Um, I, I think the key is word is maintenance. And I'll take issue with the fact when you tell me that you look at everything and you don't do it if you don't need it and you move it around back and forward. This theater right here is a good example. You just recently, not very long ago, and I have no idea how much money you spent, but you came in here and replaced, I think, all the carpet, and I'm not sure about the chairs, had those all redone. I talked about it with several of my neighbors. I'm in almost every single meeting here. I'm in this theater a lot. In our opinion, they didn't need to be replaced. You could have pushed it down the road another year or two, three. I don't know what the number is. 
But somebody is not looking. Some designer is looking at this saying, hey, it's time to replace this. Got to have a new modern carpet. Put it in here. So away we go. I think there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. I, I just think you need to look at this stuff closer. Um, my bigger concern, the golf courses are one, certainly. But the next thing is the roads. You just, somebody here to say, I had no idea how many roads are in here, but you got 50 million miles, 50, I'm sorry, 50 miles of road in this community, I think you said, Matt. You got 50 miles of road, you just spent almost a million dollars on one mile of road. And I'm not saying you didn't have to do it, it needed it. But the scary part about it is there's all kinds of roads around here that need it. Now that one was three lanes wide, so it's a million bucks for a mile approximately. Um, I don't know what it is for a mile of two-lane ride, let's say. Let's say it's a third of that, six, seven hundred thousand dollars. Fifty miles of road? Wow. I mean, you, you, you got a big, we got a huge budget problem. So, uh, I haven't heard anything mentioned here. Okay. Okay, I'm fine. You know, that's another, that would have been the first thing if I'd been the first guy here was to say, this is a big subject we're talking about. Two frickin' minutes is not enough to even worry about. You're just barely getting wound up. You know? Yeah, I know, we can come back and wind up. Just one last statement. The other thing, no mention. You give us a long list of how you've saved the community money or the former boards have. But there's no mention in here about other types of things that you could have done. Golf subsidies. You talk, we have been talking about golf subsidies and food subsidies, but nothing's happened. We've been talking about it for years. And I got to tell you, I've, I've talked to the food and beverage guy, told him what we want. He still doesn't give it. He does whatever he wants to do. Nobody says anything. I'll let, there's, there's lots more. Yeah, I could talk for hours. You Thank you. You can get back at the end of the line if you want. Just keep the line. Hi, Mona Devine, Unit 45. Uh, we are in a real pickle because the dues are still going to be much higher at the end of your plan. And I'm not talking about HOA 1, I'm talking about the other communities. We are way higher than the other communities. And the amenities that they have exceed ours. So we really are based on location-driven uh, settings and those things. So we need to find some savings. You mentioned a lot of things about energy efficiency and those things, but operationally, even in this last year, I'll just give you a couple examples, because I think a lot of us residents have this responsibility too, and you say it's insignificant amounts when we're talking about 200,000 here, 200,000 there. So just two examples, because we don't have time for others. We had three or four new positions, permanent positions that were justified when we took over golf, justifiably. All those positions were pushed over to Troon supervision, management, management of that operation. You had the opportunity, because there was vacancies during this last year, to consolidate those positions. Those new positions were added just a few years before that. So I think you need to take a little harder look at, at some of the things that we're spending on. Uh, the other area we could save some money on is uh, CAM. We definitely needed the work, everybody agrees. Even the people who had concerns said, yes, we need to do some work. But we are exceeding the firewise standards distance-wise. We could certainly pull that distance back. And we went from a 20-year cycle to an initial proposal that was a three to five-year cycle. And then there was a last-minute amendment where you added more positions and went to a one-year cycle. Can't we all live without a one-year cycle in, in level five and save that money? We've got to keep pulling back because our dues are way too high to be competitive. And thanks for the presentation. It was very well done. Uh, I'm Rhonda Galbach. I live in Unit 15. I'm not working. Hello? Is that better? OK. <laughs> Okay, Rhonda Galbach, Unit 15. Um, I'm one of the 70 percenters that do not play golf and we want to, I like to enjoy other amenities. And um, I definitely have a hard time with the exercise classes right outside this door. The room holds 30 people, maybe 35 at the most. You cannot get into the classes because they're always full. So I would like to know if you have any um, plans 
for your capital improvements to be able to give us an exercise room that can accommodate the people that want to take the classes because you can't get in. The, the room out over there, right outside this door, is as big as my kitchen. So I just really think that, you know, all we've talked about for the last two hours is golf, golf, tennis, but all the other amenities. I'm in the glass club. We share the room with two other clubs. We're only allowed to use the room a day and a half a week. So all these other amenities, if you go up to the, the ranch and you look at the beautiful, beautiful rooms they have in the huge wood shop, which is as big as the stage, all of their amenities are so much nicer, the rooms are bigger, but I just think with the money that we pay, that we should be able to take advantage of the amenities that we like to take part in without being told the room's closed or it's too small and we can't accommodate you. Thank you. My name is Diane Bywater and I'm in Unit 36. What I'd like to know is, are there any plans for an indoor heated pool? I know it's totally, totally off the subject, but I would like to know because I never heard anybody mention it. I know Saddlebrook Ranch has one, but we don't have one. And I think a lot of people would use an indoor heated pool. Are there any plans for such a thing? Uh, there are no plans. There are no plans for an indoor pool at this point in time. It doesn't, it, it doesn't mean, though, that that shouldn't be on a list of potential opportunities. There's no question about that. Right now, there is no plan. That's what CIF is for, not the reserves, but the Community Improvement Fund is available for those kinds of ideas. So it's good that you have that idea. Maybe others have it as well. Uh, and we'll know more about that when we do a facilities plan later this year. Has there right ever, now, there's no, no plans. Has there ever been a survey about the interest in one being so? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. A survey, has there ever been a survey of people we, in the community? That will be part and parcel of the facilities uh, plan later in the year. So okay. that'll be part of it, sure. Okay. No question. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Alan Grotsky and I reside in unit, <clears throat> excuse me, 23. I fully comprehend the dilemma that the community faces with respect to golf. At the same time, I would say maybe we need a fourth option, and that option should be pause. By that I mean we're talking about spending anywhere from eight to $10 million on the preserve. But I think the following questions have to be answered. Number one, with the reset of Mountain View, have we achieved the type of savings that we were, that we were told about? For instance, water usage, labor, herbicide, seed, etc. With the, um, with the um, reset of Mountain View, how many of the 107 HOA2 residents who are now annual members of HOA1 have we attracted back? And I don't think you're not going to, you're really not going to be able to answer those questions until the completion of 2025, which would give us a one, a full year of golf at the at Mountain View. At the same time, I think it was Mr. Evans down there who asked the question, what's the board's vision with respect to golf? We should know that. Is golf going to be revenue neutral? As we were told many times during the presentations to buy the two courses, or are we looking at a million dollars a year subsidies? These are all questions that I think we should, we should be able to ask and get answered. So I guess what I'm saying is that why don't we pause the preserve until we can answer those questions? I'll ask you folks again, what's the board's vision with respect to golf? Are we looking at a million dollars a year subsidy? What are we, how are we going to increase our annual members from 300 the 400 or 500. 
<clears throat> that's about what we're going to need in order to make golf revenue neutral. Thank you. My name is Joel Marmestein. I live in Unit 31. And the first thing I wanted to say is I came here having heard rumors about a $45, $4,600 special assessment, and I really wanted to get information. And I think you guys laid it out really, really good where I understand the need for it. Uh, this is the third over 55 community I have lived in. I have lived in Tucson since 2006, 10 of those years as a snowbird, living in an over 55 community in New Jersey also. There, I spent most of my 18 years on their finance committee. And I am well aware that every time, every three years, when we did a review, all the numbers changed. And I don't think a lot of people here understand it. But costs do go up every year, and you have to make allowances for that. Uh, yes, I play golf. Yes, my house, is, my house is on the golf course, so, uh, you know, I came here because you got all the facilities. The places I was in, in New Jersey, and even here in Tucson, which is Sunflower, they didn't have golf courses. I had to go to another golf course to play. Here, go out my back door, I'm at the golf course. Uh, these are the things that are important to me and it should be important to the people living here. And I just wanted to reiterate, I think you guys did a great job in laying out the financial aspect of it. And I thank you for the job you did. Vardamain, Unit 30. Um, I want to thank you for the detailed presentation that you gave. Throughout it, you multiple times stressed the negative impacts that would happen to our property values if certain courses of action were taken, such as closing a golf course. However, you totally failed to speak to the negative effects on our property values that the proposed great increases in dues and or assessments will do for the next five to 10 years. In addition, to decreasing our values, it means that for the next five to 10 years, if a person ages out of Saddlebrook, or for family or health reasons, or for whatever reasons, they want to sell their house, they will have difficulty selling it. That difficulty in selling will also translate into decreased values going into the capital investment fund. And I think it, it is inappropriate to put forward the negatives of certain choices and not the others. We need to be transparent and lay in front of the members all of the possible adverse effects that can be taking place. And it appears that you feel hostage to the potential of lawsuits from people who have golf course lots. Well, what about the effects of the negative effects on all the rest of us? We're already hearing from local realtors who are saying that prospective buyers are saying they will not look at two because of the way our dues are already. And what you are proposing is going to make everybody run away from two very fast. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Coachella, 48, 135. Mm -hmm. The lady mentioned tennis. Uh, excuse me, uh, let me talk and not talk behind my back, please. Or whoever it was. S somebody don't like that I'm having something, saying something again. This is tennis. The lady mentioned tennis. I'm a tennis player, not a golfer. Everybody knows that. But I read all the documents that McMahon did, 696 pages, the summary, and I read the paper, the, the, what they gave to you. And I just simply want to say there's a lot of, in well, there's falsehoods in the comment section. Tennis is not a declining sport. I can provide the documents from from uh, uh, that proves it, it's grown by like 6% last year in 23, 
or 22, whatever last year it was, and it's grown for the last two years. So that's false. It's a growing sport. Uh, and then I just want to say something about, my, my friend said you guys presented something where the golf deficit, uh, the, everybody, the non-golfers paying for the people who are golfing, uh, the deficit. So in 2018, the, de the deficit for golf uh, uh, was 308,000. Uh, 23, I think it was 949,000. But my point is this. From those two dates, that's an increase of 219%, I believe. That's out of control, unsustainable, not fair to the non-golfers. And uh, uh, that equates to about a 36% annual rate of increase. Again, it's unsustainable. Now. Uh, certain, certain amenities in this community are guaranteed by contract. I don't, and tennis is one of them, so you don't have a right to take our tennis courts in any way or fashion. Golf was not an original amenity of the community from the point of view that we didn't own it, Robeson owned it, and we bought it. Should have bought one, but that's, that's over the hill. But. My point is, I don't know what my point is anymore, but anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> I'll make this one much shorter. Steve Lindquist, Unit 45, Lot 98. Uh, just a couple of comments and I'll get out of here. Um, just something, some numbers I was running here the other day uh, related to golf. And I only keep going to golf and everybody else does is because it's sucking up such a huge portion of our total money coming in. Um, but something like, just so that you guys know, for the numbers that I, and you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the calculations I did show number of golfers is around 1,600 in the community. Number of, of um, annual passes was at 250 which is what I based in my calculations on. I just heard today that it was up to 303 annual passes. Okay, so we made it a little better. What that means is four to five percent of the population of this community is what we're spending all this money on, which is the golfers that buy those annual passes. They're the people that play golf avidly and they're out there all the time. Of the 1,600, there's 1,350 or so golfers that are casual golfers. Some buy punch cards, some pay as they go, some play once a week, once a month, once a year. I don't know, but they're, they're, they're not the guys that are packing the load. It's, it's those people that buy those annual passes that are the serious golfers. And if you run the numbers, basically 75% of this community are non-golfers. Roughly 25% are golfers. Now, take that number that you're spending on golf, 15, 16 million dollars, and apply that as a percentage of, the, of, of our total budget and operating costs, golf is, is far, far, far way out of proportion to their representation as far as a part of this community. You need to take a look at how we can reduce the cost there. It's, it's gotten, as I've heard many people say, it's out of control right now. Go to maintenance, don't build a new course. Just maintain what you have to have. You can still play golf. Thank you. I'm Hank Malter, Unit 46, Lot 126. First of all, I'd like to give you all a raise. You've done a hell of a job for nothing, okay? Second of all, in all the years that I lived and moved in different communities, I moved to Saddlebrook for one reason. Because number one, it's beautiful. Number two, taxes are less than sitting over in Pima County versus Pinnell. Number three, the amenities here are something that I wanted to retire to. It's my choice. Just like most of the people here, they choose it. Now I hear a lot of people just talking about preserve, 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 and the amounts of money it's potentially going to cost us. The amount of the money of the uh, assessment that is presented today, really for one year, 
because it's over a four-year period, it's around $1,100. Now, $1,100, if you take two people going to dinner outside of here once a month, you're paying $1,100 or more. You go ahead and you buy wine, you're talking about $50 a bottle. So what in the world is everybody looking at here when you're looking at a small picture versus a long picture? This is a great place. You've got great people living here. 10% are not so-so, but the 80% <laughs> are here are great. But, you know, just be realistic about what you're doing. And this board here has inherited a lot of the problems that they're trying to fix for you and for me. So please, you know, take that all into consideration. I'm not going to be around here 10 years from now. So it's all your problem. So please, just pay attention to what's going on. Thank you. My name is David Horner. I'm from Unit 47. I've been here about seven months, so I'm pretty new to everything. But uh, I was really encouraged to hear that the use of the Community Improvement Fund is not a dead subject yet because I want to make sure everybody knows using that fund for anything you want is totally up to you guys. There's nothing that restricts you from using it for new amenities, new assets. It's all your choice and everybody needs to know that. The other thing I wanted to bring up is $450,000 of saved interest by prepaying this loan. To, I, I'm for that. But it's a savings that doesn't end. It, I'm going to ask this of the, the CPAs on the board. There's opportunity cost to us coming up with that money. For me, it's taking my money out of retirement fund where I'm earning about 8%. So I'm paying, losing earning 8% to give the money to you to save 7%. I don't know how many else, how many other people are in this situation, but that's the truth of it. So, 450,000 is a good number, but we're all paying it. We're not saving it. Hi, I'm Val Zink and I live in Unit 45, Lot 15. My question's real short, kind of piggybacks on the last gentleman. How much is in the Community Improvement Fund? Uh, right now, I think it's about 1.6 million. Okay, so the amount of help that we're talking about isn't gonna like completely eliminate a $4,600 assessment, but it could, impact some a little bit yes, correct it, yeah 1.6 million towards 45 to 50 million so it's what a few percent three percent few whatever. percent that's what i thought okay thank you and thanks for your work today i thought it was an excellent presentation i'm claudia hermanson i live in unit 23 and Lot number 13. It is my third house in Saddlebrook in 22 years. And I have a lot of concerns through the years. Now, when they renovated the theater here, I was real hopeful, since I am a retired nurse, that there would be a center aisle that would have been easier for everyone to get in and out, that there would be one row of stairs and one row that would be a ramp so the people that are handicapped would be able to enjoy this theater. There are so many little things that can be done in every renovation that are not looked at. We are not ADA compatible. And for those of you that do not know what ADA is, it's the American Disabilities Act. HOA 1 is now doing that in all of their amenities, their craft rooms, uh, all of their other facilities. They are becoming ADA compliant. We are a bigger 
community than HOA1. We're a younger community and we should be looking at the requirements such as ADA. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jerry Lankin. I'm in Unit 15, and first I'd like to say what a great job you guys have done, uh, and gals. Um, I'm involved in the same kind of thing in several organizations that I belong to, and I do not envy you uh, for the decisions you have to make. We spoke a lot today about reducing costs, but going forward, this is a world of quality where people are willing to spend the money for the best. And I know that you want us to be the best, and we want us to be the best. So I think you need to be looking a little more closely, or at least talking about how to up revenues. Uh, you can only save so much money by cutting costs, but revenues is really an open-ended area where people are willing and will necessarily have to pay for more of the services that we have. So part of the money needs to come from higher fees for doing whatever it is we enjoy doing, and God knows there's a lot of it here. But the food and beverage issue is always one that seems to crop up, and I, I know that in some communities, um, there's a minimum that you have to spend every year, okay? And that would go a long way in helping the food and beverage area and having more people come to eat. Now, of course, it is incumbent upon you, Walt, to make sure that those services are well spent and that people can come and go and say, gee, that was a great meal. I know that when I want to go out to eat right now and I want to stay in the reservation, I go to the ranch because their food is substantially better than ours. Okay, and their service is substantially better. So I think if you want quality, get more people to come, spend more money, and uh, maybe we'll have those answers. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Hi, I'm Janine Grippo, Unit 49, Lot 109. Um, I want to get back to the discussion of return on investment, internal rate of return, and payback. I realize that you don't use that when you want to replace a roof that's leaking or before it leaks, but any aspirational project or any portion of a project which is aspirational should have a cost-benefit analysis with the understanding of those financial factors. An example would be the golf course at Mountain View spent $70,000 to put a new path behind. Was that right? Seven, 70000 That was an aspirational portion of that project. What else was an aspirational portion that should have had a cost benefit ranked and paid out of the CIF funds. Thank you. Mona Devine, Unit 45, Lot 100. Um, I just want to go on the record for the future. I know it's already done, but taking out a $6 million loan without getting a vote of the community is not the best method to go about getting participation and input. That should have been a vote and you need to consider that in the future because you did mention you have the legal right to do it. One of the things I used to say to people that I supervised and work with is you may have the power, and we had great power for a lot of things, that doesn't mean you should use it. And so taking out a loan without a vote just circumvents an assessment vote. Basically, you should have done it then. So I hope in the future you consider that. Claire Scott, Unit 23, Lot 43. Uh, I guess the nice thing about being old is you remember a lot of things. I remember why we were looking up there and seeing that the dues in HOA 1 was so much higher than HOA 2. When we looked at our house here, we were told by the realtor, 
heaven forbid you don't want to buy an HOA-1 because their dues are too high and they spend too much money. Well, holy smokes, did that change. But look at where it changed, okay? They spent a whole bunch of money because when I got here, out of their 27 acres, they were only playing on 18 holes of that golf course because they had to refurbish all of it because they got it from Robeson and the thing wore out. So they had to put in new sprinkler systems. They had to put in new turf. You wanted to drive around Ridgeview and take a look at the bare ground that they had there? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about normal wear and tear and failing. Now, if you really think Robeson had it to do over again that would have the same place, he's building Saddlebrook Ranch out in the middle of nowhere with the wind blowing constantly. So what did he do? He gave him the biggest pool he could find. He finally broke down and built a, a, a lot for the dogs to play in, okay? He built a crab shed because they were up here with us. So he changed what he did, and now everybody here is saying, well, why don't we have that? Because when we got here, we got exactly what we wanted. That's what we wanted. Now we don't have the pickleball courts. You see his advertisement on TV? I hope you do, because when he advertises the ranch, you got about 50 pickleball courts, and we're screaming here because we don't have them. So sitting here and trying to say that the people up here that are trying to make this place a better place uh, aren't looking out for our interest. I think they're very much looking out for interest. And what I've seen since I've been here, and I've been here now for 15 years, uh, do we need to make some changes? Sure we do. But if you're looking for some quick fixes, there aren't any. And if you think they are, the people that left here and went over to the golf courses in HOA-1 left here when Robeson still had the place. So that's why we've got a whole bunch of our problems. But thank you for all you've done and thank you for all you've put on today. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for spending these last nearly three hours with us. We appreciate you, and we are trying our very best to work for you. Have a great day.